Welcome everybody to Oceans Arena Stage, our second episode. I am Gina Panayotu, the host of the broadcast, uh, a new series that focuses on fire, fire, fireside chats and branding the industry that really does make the world go round. And today I have a guest who can truly discuss how the role um, of the association, which she represents um, the vital role. Uh, the play in making the world go round and supporting the maritime industry and community. Joining me on today's stage is uh, Mr. Fred Kenny, who is the Director of Legal and External Affairs at the International Maritime Organization. Welcome, Mr. Kenny, to today's broadcast. Thanks, Gina. It's nice to be here. Um, I've named and themed today's uh, show A Duty to Sustain a Key Industry. It is a very important industry, and I'm sure you've got a lot of thoughts uh, on that, which you will be sharing uh, with us. So without further ado, the first question touches upon a few um, important aspects, and I would like to hear from you on the role of the association. So there's a lot of things going on, decarbonization, obviously, crew welfare, um, incredible innovations and research at the moment, and uh, generally the maritime sector is undergoing great change. Uh, before we go into this individual topic, so I would really like if you could um, explain to our audience what the role is of the IMO in this respect. Sure, thanks. And uh, you're right, there, there is no question that the industry is undergoing great change uh, at, at this point when you look at the issues that are confronting the IMO uh, from, of course, decarbonization, which is, is really job one. But then when you look at um, at uh, the work that's being done on the potential for autonomous vessels uh, coming in, digitization, seafarer issues. Uh, there's a lot confronting the industry and the IMO will continue in the role that it has always had since uh, the IMO convention was first adopted in 1948. And since the organization went into operation in 1959, and that is to serve as the global regulator for the shipping industry. Of course, shipping is a, a multinational global industry, uh, and it needs a common set of rules to create the level playing fields for the industry so that all ship owners, uh, crewmen, uh, seafarers, what have you, uh, everyone in the industry is operating under the same set of rules that are universally adopted, consistently implemented and enforced. Uh, and that really is our role, uh, having a patchwork of regional or individual domestic regulation would cause so much delay, it would really hinder uh, the flow of uh, the global supply chain and thus the growth of the world economy. So having those consistent rules is critically important. They recognize that, the, the member states of the IMO recognized that in 1948, and it's still our mission today. And I think that if anybody just like visits uh, even the website of the IMO, they can see that all of the amazing work and initiatives and legislation and policy that um, have been going through over the years and making this industry uh, better in cooperation with the member states. So surely within that scope, there's a lot of challenges there. And before we go into a general overview, maybe let's focus on COVID. Um, challenges surely existed before. COVID did bring a new norm, however, um, put a pause on th some things, expedited others, uh, and in particular to our industry. I would like you to maybe share with us how the IMO has um, adapted and adjusted in this tragedy. What did you find most uh, challenging, et cetera? Well, I think that from a strategic standpoint, the IMO did not need to really amend its or adjust its strategic direction mm -hmm. because of the pandemic. Um, although the, our, the IMO assembly just did add a new strategic direction focusing on the human element and seafarers at its assembly uh, in December, uh, and that that it was an outgrowth of of the seafare crisis that has gone on during the pandemic that that we're trying to 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 manage and resolve. So I think it's less about 
adjusting or amending the strategy, but IMO certainly has had to adjust its processes so that the work of the IMO could continue through the pandemic. And that has meant creating a system where regulatory decisions could be taken in a remote setting. The organization had never had a remote meeting uh, before the, the pandemic began and uh, every meeting had been live in London. And that creates different dynamics when you're negotiating a, in a diplomatic setting. Uh, sitting in front of a, a computer screen is much different than being in the room and, and being able to forge compromise and, and gain consensus because that is really one of the key aspects of the IMO is that the decision-making process is largely by consensus. Mm -hmm. And forging that consensus from your phone or from your computer requires a different way of doing business. Now the IMO was able to adapt to that very successfully and we have continued our work uh, through the pandemic successfully, but we've also had to react to other challenges as well, in particular, the seafarer crisis. And, and that, that I think has, has really changed the workload of the secretariat. Also many of the member states as they try to deal with um, the crew change crisis so that uh, seafarers can continue to work and continue to keep shipping moving. Definitely. It's uh, very interesting, actually, that you did make a reference on the remote, remote meetings, because I think sometimes we, we get confused to coordinate three time zones. So I really don't know how the IMO managed to get so many member states on the same page for these remote meetings. In, in... It, it, <laughs> it's, it's a difficult dynamic because uh, when you, and this is my personal view, but if you look at a remote meeting, it takes longer to get anything done in a remote meeting, in my view, than it does live because people lose connectivity, their microphones are muted or, or whatever. Yeah. So it takes longer to get anything done. And then because of the time zone differences, uh, our meeting days have been reduced from five and a half hours of negotiating time in a, in a live meeting to two hours and 45 minutes in a remote meeting. So you're trying to get say 110 or 120 percent of the work done in 55 percent of the time, and that has led to backlogs in the agendas of some of the committees. Although they are working very hard to catch up, uh, we've we've come up with some innovative ways, uh, including doing a lot of the agenda items by correspondence that has allowed the committees to keep pace. But it is something to keep an eye on. And, and certainly I think we're all looking forward to the time when we can go back to business as normal. Hopefully sooner than later. <laughs> um, the pandemic, however, and you did touch upon it, crew change uh, crisis. I think everybody more or less is aware of this now and supply, supply chain crisis are the same. So maybe we can say that it, this were the positives in that it did bring these issues to the uh, spotlight to deal with some um, uh, aspects that have been uh, there and became even worse during the pandemic. Um, however, we see that the, this crew change crisis still remains uh, an, an unresolved uh, issue until today. And we've got different uh, vaccine regulations, different port restrictions, so many different things uh, across the world. So what is your take uh, on this issue and how do you feel it can be managed more successfully to hopefully finally resolve it again sooner than later? Sure. Well, I would say that the crew change crisis uh, has been a really difficult issue to resolve. And, and I, I think, Jeannie, as you correctly pointed out in your introduction to this issue, uh, it has raised the visibility of shipping. And, and uh, uh, I have found it remarkable the amount of coverage that the crew change price crisis has brought. I, my view uh, as, as the Director of External Relations at the IMO, which includes media and communications, is that the crew change crisis has received more media coverage globally than really any other issue I can think of. Mm -hmm. But what I have 
and, and, the, and that was intentional on the part of IMO and the shipping industry. A lot of the, the industry organizations, IT, ITF, ICS, uh, Intertanko, uh, a lot of uh, intermanager, a lot of them have put a lot of effort into, into raising the visibility of this issue in the media. And the purpose of that was to make decision makers aware of the, the special challenges that seafarers were facing and are facing and continue to face uh, and why it was so important to resolve those so that we could keep supply chains going, including the delivery of things like vaccines. Um, so it, it really is critically important. And the, the goal was to reach decision makers that might not normally deal with shipping, such as persons in the Ministry of Health, as opposed to the Ministry of Transport. And I think the outreach effort was tremendously successful. Every major network around the world carried stories. Every major newspaper carried stories. The coverage was incredible, yet the problem persists. And that, I think, is something we're going to have to look at carefully to see why the message isn't resonating better and why decision makers aren't realizing that seafarers need special status. Seafarers need to be designated as key workers. Uh, the protocols for safe crew changes uh, developed by the industry need to be implemented in every country and access to vaccines and medical care need to be available to seafarers. Uh, we're not there yet. And I, I sometimes scratch my head as to why. <laughs> I agree with, I was just about to say that for me, I mean, it's just common sense. We were uh, denoting everybody as key workers like store workers at grocery stores and nurses. But how do the groceries get there? How do the medicine get to hospitals? I mean, let's just go a step uh early and see where the the chain begins so it was just uh, i'm still scratching my head also on that one so yeah i i am too i mean there is there's more work to be done clearly if you look at just the raw numbers of the 175 imo member states there are still only 62 that have designated seafarers as key workers so there's clearly more work to be done there and once they're designated as key workers the what goes with that status needs to be implemented for seafarers, including foreign seafarers that might be in ports so that they get access to vaccines, they get access to medical care. If a crew change is occurring in a foreign port, they can get home uh, without unreasonable disruption or delay. Definitely. Let's hope that this visibility, at least that came with the pandemic, is a step forward and uh, that it is bringing these issues to a resolution somehow. Um, as I mentioned earlier, even before COVID, there were a lot of matters at stake, just maybe COVID highlighted some. Uh, but one of the important things that and the major area of focus for the IMO is, of course, also seafarers abandonment, which, yes, does happen. Um, maybe you would like to explain, because I know you've done a lot of work on this, on how this issue affects our industry as a whole. And uh, what would be the ideal strategy maybe to resolve it or priorities to deal with it going forward? Um, thanks, Gina. And it, as you said, this is an extremely significant issue facing the industry. Unfortunately, the trend is quite alarming. Uh, we only had 48 abandonments in 2019 before the pandemic. That jumped up to almost 90 in 2020, so it almost doubled. And then last year, 2021, there were 95 abandonment cases, which uh, is is far in excess of anything we've, we've ever seen uh, before. And regrettably, uh, here we are in January of 2022, and we're averaging almost a case every other day now. Uh, so the, the situation is, is, is getting more serious. Uh, of course, there are different reasons for abandonment. Um, generally, they're financial. Uh, the pandemic has made many of the cases much more difficult to resolve because uh, they're difficult to resolve as it is. But then when you add that once you resolve the case, you may not be able to get the seafarers repatriated to their home countries. Um, it's a real issue. Of course, 
Uh, the key is compliance with the Maritime Labor Convention standards that require abandonment insurance. And, and we find that cases are much easier to resolve if the ship is properly insured, but that takes oversight by both the flag state and the port states to ensure that ships entering the port have the proper abandonment insur insurance. But we're only uh, there less than half of the cases that we're resolving are, uh, um, or that we're seeing uh, proper insurances in place, which, um, but I think uh, we are working actively. Um, the IMO legal committee has a correspondence group that is developing guidelines for flag states and port states to resolve abandonment cases. Because one thing that we're seeing is, is that in some cases, there's a lack of awareness on what to do and how to properly handle a case when a ship's been abandoned. Uh, and uh, I think these guidelines will really be helpful. The goal is uh, to have them uh, endorsed by the legal committee at its meeting in March, and then it will move on to a joint IMO ILO working group uh, and hopefully be approved. But, but I think awareness of the issue and knowing what to do in the situation is going to be very important for moving forward so that if we continue this trend of more and more abandonments, they can be resolved quickly. Definitely. I think always the, this form of guidance on how to manage situations should always uh, set, set the, the, the right path forward. So we look forward to that being endorsed. <laughs> um, we talked about it already. Undoubtedly, seafarers have been the mostly affected through this pandemic. And uh, I think I've got <laughs> an interesting question. So not only with the port uh, state um, uh, port, sorry, change crisis, uh, they were stuck at sea. Some of them couldn't go back to work. It was a whole um, uh, ripple of effects that happened there for their families. For them, some of them exceeded even 12 months on board and no shore base leave to mention. Uh, do you foresee that this great resignation that is happening in other sectors for other reasons, of course, um, that followed COVID and their unwillingness to follow the seafaring, um, seafaring sorry, profession uh, will follow also in the um, due to this uh, situation with the COVID crisis. Uh, how can it be avoided from an IMO perspective? How do you? Uh, what's your grasp uh, grasp on this? Well, I think um, that we're not necessarily seeing, or, or or if it's happening, it's unclear, and some of that may be that it's getting masked by the fact that there are some major seafaring supply countries that are having trouble getting their seafarers out to ships for various reasons. The Omicron variant has highlighted that there are some major seafaring supply countries that are really struggling with that, uh, which has led to an inability of their seafarers to get out to ships. Are we seeing seafarers leaving the industry in droves? Um, it's difficult for me to say, but I, 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 I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, I was having a, a conversation with a seafarer who actually had gotten stranded twice during the pandemic, was stranded over his contract, was able to finally get back home, went back out on another contract and got stranded again, uh, but was still saying, oh, I plan to stay at sea, it's my profession. Um, and this is critically important uh, that we resolve this issue and we also continue to make the industry attractive mm -hmm. to young people so that we get new people. And that's across the globe and across cultures, um, you know, we we definitely need uh, more women in the in the seafaring uh, ranks. Uh, we need a more diverse industry, uh, and IMO has programs in place to promote exactly that, and we will continue to do so because. Even with uh, the rise of automation and digitization of the industry, 
there is still going to be a need for seafarers and actually some are predicting that demand for seafarers will grow because the demand for shipping will grow um, over time. Uh, and those seafarers are going to have to be very well trained uh, in ways that they may not have needed to be before, but seafaring is, is a much more technically based profession uh, and, and automation based and digitization based than it was in the past. And we're going to need people with very special skill sets and the right training and experience to safely operate ships in the future. True, and I mean, uh, I fully agree, and there's so much talk about how shipping should, be, should become more sustainable, and I would also say like vice versa, I mean, we sh shipping is the most sustainable method of uh, transport, so I do believe it will be growing, and it's a very exciting uh, time on how the seafaring career will also evolve, so hopefully uh, this will be the case. So even though this discussion could really elaborate into, I guess, two hour, an hour, two hours discussion, I am drawing towards the end with this last question. Uh, you explained throughout the interview, and I think we've quite well understood the role of the IMO and how you are supporting member states um, and giving them the guidance uh, necessary to resolve issues, challenges, whether, whether it's sustainability, crew welfare uh, or other. So being at the helm of uh, the legal and external affairs, which covers a wide scope of uh, duties and roles, if you did have the ability or the magic powers rather, to, uh, I know it's a difficult question, but it would be really nice to hear. Uh, and you could fully tackle with this magical powers three key issues, which you feel would make the greatest impact for a better maritime uh, future, which would those be? Um. I think the first one that I would want to address, and we've discussed it uh, mm -hmm. through, this, through this podcast a, a, a number of times already, and that's raised the visibility of the industry. The industry has remained a quiet giant for most of its history. And I think that was intentional by a lot of actors, but I don't think that's sustainable in the future. Mm -hmm. It is important that, that the world's population understand shipping understand its importance to everyone, to their everyday lives, as you mentioned earlier. Uh, and to do that requires, I think, uh, some transformation in the industry to be more communicative, uh, to identify the issues so that the general public will identify with them and uh, reach solutions. I think the crew change crisis really puts a highlight on that. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, I, I think there, there's a lot of benefits to be gained from raising uh, the, the visibility of shipping. And that leads me into the, probably the second thing uh, that I would like to see and, and, and something that we're continuing to work on at the IMO. And, and that's to remove uh, uh, some of the, the, the substandard actors that are in the industry, you know, those those that are abandoning crews and, and creating humanitarian crises for the crews that have been abandoned, those that are fraudulently registering vessels and operating fraudulently registered vessels, which is another thing IMO is addressing, because those vessels are operating without any legitimacy. You don't know if they're safe. You don't know if they're committed to protecting the environment, Where and, and they undercut the law abiding legitimate ship owners who are trying to comply with all the regulations who are trying to do the right things the right way and we should be honoring those men and women who who are running the industry in a responsible manner by getting the the actors that aren't willing to do so um and get them out of the industry really and and you know create that level playing field that i think everyone wants and the third thing I, I, I am, have continued to work on, and I think it's it's important, is is making the industry more diverse. As I mentioned earlier, um, uh, there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, IMO and WISTA, as you may know, are working on a, a study uh, regarding women in the industry that's going to be released here um, uh, in the near future. I think the results of that are going to form the, the basis for a lot of 
thought and action as to how we can make the industry more diverse in, in, in all ways, uh, because uh, there is strength in diversity. Uh, and we need, uh, I think shipping is going to need all the talented people it can find in the future. And we, we have to look in every corner to find those people and develop them. Most definitely. And I mean, as an active member of WISTA and uh, WISTA UK Secretary, I definitely believe that uh, we need more women on board and on shore because it's like excluding almost 50% of the population. So it, it, it couldn't make more sense. Um, and of course, it goes without saying that your first point, especially is the reason after all of this broadcast, and it, we're very committed to branding the industry because it does really make the world go round. Having said that, this was such an insightful discussion. And uh, maybe on air, I would happily like to invite you to have a second session on the fraudulent uh, <laughs> registers and uh, raising the level um, and quality of the industry. I think that would be a very important and interesting topic. And it was a pleasure having you on Oceans Arena stage today. Well, thanks, Gina. It was a pleasure to be here. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about the IMO. A very great discussion, very insightful. Uh, Mr. Fred Kenny from the IMO, Legal and External Affairs uh, Division, of course. Uh, I'm Gina Panayotti, and this was another broadcast of Oceans Arena Stage, uh, committed to branding the industry that makes the world go around. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>